Turn on the machines. Put the power on. It's that time again. You know what time it is. It's Wednesday, True House Stories Day. And thankfully, we're always here. You can count on us. And sometimes we're a minute behind or a minute early, but we're always waiting for you to come on. Anyway, we have a bit of like a Indian summer starting here in America again. It's it's thir- 28 to 30, which is about 81 degrees Fahrenheit, which is nice and warm in New York. It's I was sweating outside, running back to get ready. And of course, I'm all excited after doing my workout today because I wanted to be a supermodel. I wanted to be a supermodel, <laughs> but that was never my calling. It was too short. And I didn't have the Schwarzenegger physique, so I missed my call. But I was blessed to be involved in something called the music industry. And thankfully, what we're going to go to in a second and speak about this great man. Um, I want to thank you all. We've been coming on TikTok Live now. TikTok has given us the okay to start going on live, which is super, super duper cool. And where's the fall? Fall is coming. Trust me, it's coming because Monday is Aborigines Day for some people, Columbus Day in America, which we try not to talk about anymore, but now it's Aborigines Day. And normally by October, it starts getting a little cooler and all that. So welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. And this week, we're going to be talking to this most handsome prince who's one of Germany's longest serving DJ and producers. And he's known as a cosmonaut because he's around royalty of Tom Novi and Iniac and Mogwai. And that man's name is Phil Fulner. Phil Fulner, okay? He's a big disco fanatic, produces a lot of disco house stuff, remixes and also was a supermodel at one time and still going strong was a resident space which is one of the most finest clubs known in the game and it's just so much we're going to hear from my man mr fulner and i don't want to ruin it by telling you too much but i will say this back in 98 he did a fantastic cover of s express okay That was a dance chart topper in Germany. And that's very hard to do is have records in Germany that become pop hits. And he learned that formula. He figured it out and he got it to happen. So without further ado, we're going to bring up to the stage, Mr. Phil (laughs) Fulna. Thanks for all the kind words, man. (laughs) Welcome, Mr. Phil. How are you? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm fine. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on the show. And yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it, it went too early, uh, uh, dark today, you know, and it's the oh. end of the summer. Temperatures are still very, very nice, very comfortable, but it gets dark quite early. And uh, that's why I put the curtains so you don't have to look at the black outside, at the black outside, but it's, but I'm fine. So for everyone, remember, let, hello, guten Tag, guten Nacht, and he- welcome again, welcome to the show. And of course, we couldn't ask for a better legend than yourself. Um, and let me tell everybody this. You know how many weeks I've been rescheduling Mr. Fuldner? <laughs> I'll tell you why. He's been busy playing out in a bees and all over the place. So I don't feel that bad, but it was like, come on, dude. He's like, no, no, we're going to do it. So thankfully, I want to say thank you again. And as a big applause to you, my brother, for coming on a very special show that, you know, basically helps keep the history of all of you. Because it's your stories, not mine. Anyway, welcome in again. So I just go right to the first question and make it very comfortable. Mr. Phil Fulner. The young Phil, the kid, how does music find you back in the day, my brother? Well, thanks for asking. (laughs) Music was always in the family. 
uh, when I reminisce, my my mother always was was a great singer, and um, uh, not a professional singer, but a great. She sang all around the house, and we the, we had the radio on all the time, and um, we were singing along with her uh, to, to the radio. And my father still is an excellent piano player, and so music was always a part of. Of, of of the household of, of the family and my sister she was she was playing the piano or she tried and she making she had a great time um, practicing the piano with uh, with uh, with a friend laughing all the time and yeah and the, the radio was playing in the house and um, I started off very early to um, to record tapes with my cassette recorder from the radio and um, and it, it appears to me that music always has been a in, been a part of me, and I know from from uh, in the deep of my heart, in the depth of my heart, that it will be a part of my life and a part of my work someday. And now you are gone. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm, I'd like to. I'm the only one. There you are again. <laughs> no, I like to. I like to. These days, I like for people to be zooming in right in on how handsome you really are. You know, what I'm saying this way. I, I step away. It's not my show. It's your show. Oh, I'm, I was a little bit irritated. <laughs> <laughs> so you said about your father. So the, what kind of music at such a young age was being played around you? That well, my, my father was a jazz enthusiast. He was into classic music. Um, he learned to play the piano, classic music. And then one day he was hit like a bus uh, by jazz music. And uh, he listened to jazz music on the radio to Count Basie and, and guys like that and, and Duke Ellington. And, um, and I remember he told me a story that he was supposed to, or he was, um, um, he, was um, he should play a, a, a piano, a classic piano concert in his, in his school. And um, he was so into jazz music that he and everybody was invited, you know, all the all his all his colleagues and all the the teachers and and he said he quit and he said I couldn't do it I won't do it because I love jazz and I won't play I I promise you I won't play classic piano anymore and that's what he did, and on there on the other side there was my mother who fed us young ones with um, Carlos Santana with the Bee Gees with uh, Super Tramp and uh, with um, James Brown, Cool and the Gang, and Abba, of course, and Barbara Streisand, and my elder sister. She fed me with electric. Uh, he, she, she, she brought me to electronic music actually, and she, uh, she was listening to to the to the first house tracks that came up, and um, friends of her, friends from school went to went to the states and brought that that that, that record collection, the history of the house sound of Chicago. They brought it over to Germany. And we must have listened to the record a thousand times, you know, un until it until it was broke. And so there were a lot of different influences, more like like uh, yeah, like um, not that industrial kind of influences that a lot of my colleagues had, like Kraftwerk or 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 Depeche Mode. It was more the soul side. It was more like um, an even northern soul, and um, that's what what influenced me musically from the from the very start and that's changes everything because remind me what german pop music was called because i my, i have my assistant man well we always laugh about the name of german pop music it was a very funny name that you know you heard in the 80s and 70s on the radio mm -hmm. uh, 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 uh lager lager Right, Lager? is that Lago or Slaga? Something like that. It was even Donna Summer. Oh, Schlager. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? Because I I got to spend so much time in Germany. I got to learn all these things, which makes it that much more interesting for me when I'm traveling to really appreciate why American music was so you know touching to all of you. I get it now mm. because some of the music that was coming out during that time was you know. Like Barbie doll music, <laughs> so of course I mean, Schlager was um, uh, Schlager was um, the, the German. I mean, 
I hope I got I, I got I got it right. Um, Schlager was like it was the was the German moralist uh, around the corner translation for beat Schlager. It's a hit hit Schlager beat music, you know. And Germany was very into that into that uh, Beatles thing, and um, so um, it they the German culture and German music culture adopted that kind of beat music and. And uh, they they had one of their first gigs in at the famous Star Club, um, the Beatles in in Hamburg, and so it was uh, it was a big market here for them. And you know everybody turned in that direction. All the you know the, the hairstyle and and the cloth is all it was all like Beatles like. And that I mean, it felt like that it was on for even more than than a decade. And so it was all influenced by, yeah, by by yeah, by British pop music, by American music, of course. And um, you know, we had all these 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 German or these American original American recordings that came up in Germany with German vocals. You know, not one to one translation, but with a little bit of twist. And and it, and then it came to me that uh, when I when I when I grew older and I heard and listened to more music that all these german hits are originally from the states you know some 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 disco tracks and some uh, even like um you're the one that i want you know from 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 um, john travolta and um featured by john travolta and olivia newton john and there was like there was a ge title in germany that called the vanne is full i mean the bass tube is filled up you know and it was more or less it was a fun song. It was a joke. It was not taken to tape to be taken serious, and so um, the Germans took the 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 international songs and international artists and translated them in a kind of very very special and very own way into German songs and into German and and brought the German lyrics onto this onto these tracks. So, like even for example, John Travolta, who really didn't have a musical career in America. Mm -hmm. was loved in germany right and another yep. one who was on night rider became <laughs> massive in germany singing david hasselhoff yes it's crazy right it's but germany only nowhere else just germany they love to be big in the states i mean they well, watch and stuff that yes as a hollywood actor mm. but never as a singer okay i mean yeah, I, I can i i can remember that I can only remember this one song that he did, and yeah, I, yeah, he was he was very big. He was very big in Germany, and he still is. The song has been played in the, at the Oktoberfest, you know, and that, and at the at, on, at the Luna Park, and it's still on. The people need some drinks, and everybody's going off to that song. So as we're going to school, Phil, did you have any formal training musically? Because your dad's a pianist, have you learned any instruments along the way in your life? Yeah, I learned to play the piano, but um, I learned to play play the piano, but I never learned it, you know. And uh, I can I can throw some chords, and that's fine for me. That's all what's left. But I, but it helped me to to get behind the the feeling of music, the feeling of harmonies, and to arrange harmonies. And I got to the musical school from a quite early age, and I was. Uh, the only thing I can remember that we only made fun the whole time. You know, we had that little magnets, and uh, the the line of the of, of of the nose, you know, and with the with with a board, and we just threw the magnets on 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 the. Uh, Let me ask know. you. A question. Let me ask this, because I play piano as well. Are you talking with staff lines, and then you throw the magnets, and wherever they sit, you play you play it. So yeah, if the magnets were for the notes. You know. Right. So if they fall on a G or an A, then you yes, yes. Down. Okay, that's they what should. Thought. You know they should, but we just made fun of it and pinned it all around the place, and um, uh, and then I played. Yeah, I, I used to play the piano for a couple of years, but it never went that well. But I um, uh, I was trained as a prof as 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 a as a singer, a, a baritone. And I had that. I was trained for um, almost a decade, or like ten or twelve years, until my my um, my teacher went back. He 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 was a Japanese guy, and he then he went back and he retired and went back to to Japan, 
and he um, was uh, he had a lot of a lot of, uh, he had a lot of um, quite prominent pupils and and oh and you're one that, you're famous too what are you talking about <laughs> before me you know <laughs> I was one of his last Asiatic disciples and um, what was his name the Japanese uh, instructor Tatsuzo Tajima. Did you sing in Japanese as well, or you sang just in German? I sang in, in Japanese as well when oh, I was really? at a Japanese restaurant and I was drunk. Yeah, I don't know anything about Japanese. This show <laughs> brings out so much stuff that people never, probably, never knew anything about. I didn't know anything about you speaking and singing Japanese. Wow. <laughs> yeah, oh, I was German, ah. German, German Japanese. I, he, he he told me a few words, you know, so I'm. I can order some food, you know, and can order my sake, but nothing beyond that. But he was he was a good teacher, and he was like a um, he was um, a, he was a Buddhist, and he taught me about Shin Yuan. That was uh, the 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 Buddhistic circle he was into, and he was very um, and he was living that 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 kind of of, of religion, but completely open minded. And we, yeah, we had a great time. Uh, and he was he was a great he was a hard teacher, but um, we had a really really good time. And he taught me a lot. And he was like a more or less like a some kind of a father figure for me, and helped me trying to find my my way of expressing my singing and my voice. And um, yeah, and and taught me all the 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 the, the fine things. The 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 really what's what's going on. Be, be, be on, and he taught me to get, um, um, taught me to, he taught me to let me say, of course, to get better and to, to, to sing without a monitoring and, and, and listen to what's really going on musically. And it was, um, it was a great thing to happen for me. That and helped me a lot in my in my in my oh room. sure it did. You got formal training that helps with everything you do with this music that you're producing and writing. Oh yes, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, the more practice you you do, the better you get. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so def definitely. The road, the road to a, to becoming an adult, because you know, we, there's a time we were all kids. The road of I want to be. You know, a fireman or a postal worker or a lawyer. Mm. Was it in your mind more? I want to be an artist, singer, professionally, first, or what was it on the on your ladder of of success? Well, um, um, I always want. I think I, I, when I can remember I, from from the very start, it was into my mind that I wanted to do something with music or something with art, some kind of expression, some some kind of way to express myself maybe on on as a singer on stage or or something like a place where where i can express myself and um but i think it was it was a very i think it was 80 percent music from the start on my mind that i wanted to do something with music you know and i can remember i was um, um my sister my elder sister she made her a level in school and then they had like a big party to like two schools uh, were like close to each other and they had a big party and and um and there was one of the other ones very good looking turkish guy Attila Ceyla and um he was standing i knew him he was a friend of he was a he was a, um, a homie of my sister and he was standing there with his cowboy boots on you know with a tight shirt and two turntables two james brown records and a mixer and he was playing, he was DJing, and all the girls were standing around him. And I said to myself, that's what you want to do. <laughs> and um, and then one thing came to another. And before that, I, I recorded like um, um, tracks from the radio, you know, and um, I can, well, as far as I can remember, all of my colleagues did that. They, they mixed their own tapes and um, and it, it, it fascinated me, even I, I was even thinking about becoming a DJ on the radio, or so, and um, and I and then we I can remember we started off DJing like from a very analog you know turntable. Let me ask you, Phil. Sorry, everyone, for that emergency alert. 
sound that came through that was America testing all the phones. I forgot it was going to hit at 220 and it went, <laughs> sorry, the house is not doing anything wrong. The studio is fine. So when you first saw the guy with the cowboy boots and at your sister's uh, party, okay, did you really know what he was doing as a DJ or you just was taken by the fact that he was a magnet? Uh, a good, very good question. I think it was both of it, and I knew what you, I knew what he was doing. I, 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 um, the DJ culture, and I can't remember when it first appeared to me. And uh, DJing, I, I knew that the, what he was doing there, and I think I was, we were already into DJing. I don't know if you can call it DJing because we were playing tracks from tapes at at uh, um, when our friends had parties at home, you know, and from from they invited all the the, the guys from there from from like the, all the classmates, and they we we came together and had a party at home, you know, and with one record player and one speaker, you know, and we started uh, and we um, we 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 played, we played the tracks from cassette or even from a tape recorder. And um, so I had a slight idea of what DJing was about, and of course, I, I, I um, um, in the late, in, in the early '80s, we had there were already pictures coming over from the guys in stu at, at the Saint or Studio Fifty Four, who were playing records and of DJs, what DJs do and what the DJ equipment is all about, and what what kind of record player you you had to have and stuff. And I knew all that, but it was the thing that happened there that he was like the magnet and that he was the, the master of ceremony in that place. Is that what, what, what really attracted me? And that's why I asked that question, because everybody has that moment of like the caveman. Fire! We found <laughs> fire! You know that yeah. feeling? And mm -hmm. I remember mine. I remember seeing it for the first time and it was, you know, and you don't forget it. It gets us like the first kiss and I don't want to be too explicit. First, everything, you know, first time you do something, first time you go down a roller coaster, of course, second, third time you do it, you get the same feeling, but it's never like the first time, you know, yep. when you experience something. It's like so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So, of course, at that time, hip hop is starting to make its way through. Because Run DMC in the early 80s. So you're seeing the DJ in the back, like Jam Master J playing, and these records are becoming big. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not, say, in the circuit yet of going out clubbing, you're turning on this new thing called, I don't know if remember if Germany had it yet. Uh Vivo, no, not Vivo, MTV at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he had started here in America watching rap videos and first people and they had DJs. Maybe they weren't doing anything because the generation we all come from, there was no computer yet. There was no YouTube yet. There was no internet yet to learn mm -hmm. any of this. So you had to go to the record shop per se and pull the magazine and look and maybe buy it to see what DJs were doing in America, what DJs were doing in the UK, what German DJs were doing, and such and such. So I can understand you saying to me that yes, you knew what was going on, but the information of how we do things now to then, it was like discovering gold back then, Phil, right? Of course. Yes, of course. Every, I, everything was like was was like um it, it was it was like a like a, a practicing art and yes you had to you had to check the magazines and you had to and, or read the magazine at your friend's house and and i can remember we had um uh, when all the other kids were 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 um were watching rtl television when it was initiated here in germany i we couldn't we couldn't receive it we because the antenna of on, on the top of our house was looking in a different direction and I, but we were able to receive top of the pops. And that was amazing for me. And, um, and they, and even the, the, the early neighbors series with uh, Kylie Minogue, Jason Donovan and stuff, 
that was not so really house music, but um, uh, it, it, yes, it was it was uh, a big thing discovering what was going on there. But we were so into it, and we were so like soaking it up all of the time that we drew, we drove for miles with the bus or with the train to 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 listen to records or to buy records or to buy magazines or to see DJs or artists perform. Um, I was and there's one thing I almost I always I almost forgot. I was very into hip hop music too, into rap music, and uh, first of all, like of course, like guys like T Ski Valley or, or or Curtis Blow. All that was like uh, related to to funk music more or less and then in my skateboarding days and uh, i spent so much time on on boards on surfboards or skateboards we were um we were going to a famous to a famous place in um and not that famous but they got all the bands all the hip-hop bands there and all the sound systems at Tordrei in Düsseldorf, Germany. And we were listening to Buya Tribe, New Funky Nation. We were listening to Ice T, Donald D, Evil E, Hijack, uh, to, to Buya Tribe. Um, oh, I said that we, we uh, to NWA was there. And um, even um, UK hip hop, like Silver Bullet. Yeah. And we were, we were going to, to all that concerts and listening to, the, to that music. And so, and I can rem can remember then, like, I was still into skateboarding when uh, Two Unlimited came up with their hits, and I brought it to my hip hop friends, and uh, we were hanging around and having having a drink, having having a drink, having a smoke, and, and doing skateboarding. And at the end, everybody was partying. I was playing that record, and everybody was going bananas. And so, yeah, I did my contribution <laughs> to to bring house music to my skateboarding friends. How so I don't know if you can call it house music. Well, you know what I mean? The, the, the music of the time, let's say yeah. hip hop and all that. How much, let's see. Did anyone formally teach you how to beat match? Because you were working on vinyl in those days. You weren't, mm -hmm. there was no such thing called the sync button like now, which yeah. is not a bad thing. But Pioneers made it very easy for everybody to become a DJ. Mm -hmm. Back then, to be a true DJ was a very expensive proposition. You know, to have to buy music, learn the craft, really put everything you have into it. It wasn't like now. Um, did someone actually show you the basics of playing or did you just pick it up as you went? Well, um, yeah, I had, I, had, um, I had one or two major teachers but it always it was clear to me that there is a technique or what what you have to do i mean what you have to do to beat match you have to bring the records together somehow and start it on maybe on, on to 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 bring these things together in a or to bring two records together in the perfect way or in, in the technically perfect way and in the musically perfect way and um, it was clear to me that there that it only can work with the, you know, with 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 speed, with the speed of the record, and the right starting point. And but doing that, you know, <laughs> all that picture, and but doing that is is a different thing, you know, practicing and theory. And um, I am um, Bert Vogt, who was that was a guy. He's still. I think into DJing, but more like for small corporate events or for private events. And he was a resident in um, in the Modell Traumwelt in Essen, a city close by, a city nearby. And he and I got my first regular job there playing records on a Monday. The place was packed on Monday. You could go on every day in the week and everybody, and everybody was going out. And uh, there was a special club or special discotheque you can go to on every specific day in the week. And he taught me how to do it. And he taught me in, in the, in the, I learned it the hard way in a club without monitoring, you know, and okay. a very large space with the great sound system. But you had, you know, you had that delay from the sound. And I, and I, and I didn't know what I was doing wrong because it too, at, at, I, I was practicing at home. Everything worked out great. And then in the club, I was always behind. And he told me, hey, there is no monitoring here. You got to control that. You got to do that. Uh, you got to 
um, um, can, you, you have to do the final control on the headphone before you pull the fader up so that the records are, you know, that the records are matching beat wise. And, um, and um, it was like, yeah, I, it, I had some hard times there, but in the end, really, really great times because we knew the crowd, we know what record to play. And um, I learned my lesson well there. And um, I think Bertie is still on. And um, I, I had some friends uh, who started off with me, Christian Inhaus, a great artist. And uh, he's, he's a painter and he does uh, sculptures and stuff. And we started off uh, DJing together as a team. And um, I got my first um, Technics uh, player. And um, I can remember that I wanted to do a, a driving license for a Vespa, you know, a scooter. Okay. And uh, the, my mom, the friend of my mom, and he was a doctor, and he said, I have so many really horrible accidents. They come to me in, in, in the, in, um, to, to the hospital of a motorbike, a motorcycle, and scooter accidents. And I don't want you to make that driving license. And if you stop doing that, exercising that driving license, you get a thousand bucks for me, a thousand Deutschmarks, and right now at once. And I said, okay, I quit. Give me the money. <laughs> And that's where by I was able to to buy my first. I could have I I, I um um to afford my, my the, the first equipment, my first turntable, and um the other one was a dual analog uh, a player, and we had like a really really cheap mixer, and um, the other friend Christian who bought also his first uh, techniques, and then we had like two and a mixer, and then the whole thing started off, and then we we. We had like uh, uh, yeah parties from from our elder uh, um, um, from his elder brother and my elder sister and we were like come on you have to play there and we bought the records and we were so so excited to go there and and play some records for the elder guys and for the elder ones and yeah that's that was also a thing of practicing. So as you of course. Each time you do your gigs, the more you play in front of people, the better you get. Of course. When does it begin for you to say to me, or when you should say to yourself, I'm ready to now do this all the time? Because in the beginning, you're probably getting a gig here or you're doing a party there. And when, is it, when do you say, I'm going to really jump into this now as a profession? I'm not going to do this as for, you know, professional now. Well, I think it it, it, it it just one thing came to another. It wasn't really a, a, um, a decision that I made one day. It was always clear to me that I wanted to do something like this and something with music and um, if not a singer, then a DJ or something like that. And then it became, I, I mean, I started off um, studying architecture because my... my ah, yeah. okay because my, my, my parents are architectures and my grandparents, and it was so it was like running in the family. And um, nobody forced me to do that. But I said, um, I, I'm, my father said, hey, what about try it out? You know, I can help you becoming an architect. And, and you know, you, it, it, it's, it's, it's a nice business, it's fun, and, and you can learn all the skills from me. And um, so I said, okay, let's do it. But I was always doing music. And then um, I think it was when when it started to get uh, successful, and then the decision was made by itself. You know, it um, we were uh, back in the days in the nineties. Um, it wasn't that influential business like it is today. Everyone wants to be a party DJ, so you go and you could go into the club and ask. To get in, get in touch and talk with somebody who is in the club, who is maybe like a, like a waiter or like a bouncer, right. or you can go up to the DJ and say, hey, "I'm DJ too. Can I? What do I have to do to 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 maybe to to come and play and uh, for for an evening? And if you like it, I can come some more often. And you could talk to the people, to 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 the owners, to the prom promoters. There weren't any promoters like back in the days, and or like they are now." And it was much more easier to get in touch to, uh, with with the with the people in charge, and so um, we were like playing. We were locally known f 
for the things we did for our friends and for the parties at school and maybe some smaller things and in, in, in a smaller town hall and so we got quite well known locally and then it was just a matter of time um, like back in the days when um, the people get to know you better and we were like do, writing the first articles for for a magazine um, like uh, four pages on a black and white copy machine and uh, it was called Trendline now it's called face magazine you know and um, uh, I can remember uh, I was writing like two articles for for uh, a club gig that took place in in Bavaria you know when the crew the whole crew from from Gelsenkirchen where this 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 magazine was invented by Klaus Pieper from Genlock who is still an active life act today. He was famous back in the days, Klaus Pieper and Olli Kunze. And um, uh, there we, um, I wrote the, one of the very first articles. And so I'm still in a way related to that magazine. And, um, and not to be forgotten, I um, became, um, after my, 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 my good friend Christian Inhaus was going more and more into art, I um, uh, stuck together to my uh, to to the to my sister friend back in the day, Andre Andre Tegler, better known as Mogwai, and we became very very close friends, and um, and he was into uh, he was a into like he was a mod, like riding a scooter and listening to 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 Northern Soul even uh, um, um, bands like. Uh, or like like psychobilly music, like Batmobile and stuff, and um, he became also a, a lover of that electronic music. And we started off playing records together, doing gigs together, and um, and and he bought his his, and he also bought um, his Technics turntables. And we yeah we had a lot of great. Uh, we went to the Love Parade together and and um yeah we had great times amazing times and everything started off there and we started off uh, we started our career together and that's you see that's just funny and of course it hasn't ended it's just it's beginning from there yes and now the djing is taking off and you're doing that when does this songwriting and production thing begin for you because that's a lot of people know you outside of the djing some of the records you were involved in and some of the a lot of the success you were involved in with it when mm -hmm. has you know because everybody always asks how do you get into that like how do you how or has that music business find you because it's not easy yeah. to get in as you know well i um 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 it started off like uh we had our we were quite well known as djs um and it was um it it was a a parallel history, Mogwise and mine, because we were doing all the stuff together. We were traveling around and playing solo and playing as a team. And um, we bought our first equipment together and put some stuff together here in my mama's house. And in, in, I think one of the one of the bedrooms upstairs, we had our um, uh, Roland JD 800 and like a, like I think the music program was called the the, the the DAV was uh, was called the door was called Creator. Creator was the program, and we had like a like I think it was uh, I remember it was a synthesizer and um, if I remember, it was called C Lab Creator. C Lab Creator. My God, I haven't thought about that too. You just said I went. <laughs> that's a PC program. I remember that people tell me about they were using C Lab. I think C hyphen Lab Creator. That's how far back we're going. Everybody, get your pen and paper out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, and it was it was it was media only. No no audio stuff and no audio was around yet. No. Not at that time. No. And we were like putting records together uh, and we haven't even had our own label Magoo Records and we did two releases very very like yeah um like some very complicated disco house music <laughs> and uh, um not very successful but we 
and we put all our energy and all our effort in there as and, you would um, as you would because you yeah. cuz and, and I know this every producer who's ever started in this game every record you ever did is the best at <laughs> yes. making it right it's, like, it's the greatest thing we've ever done I mean, it sounded horrible, but I mean, the track was, was was great, but the mix was 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 awful, and um, but a, a lot of tracks back then were quite were just lo-fi because of the technique, and um, um, and uh, then we yeah we bought our first stuff, and then we you know imitating this and that guy and listening getting influenced by by a lot of genres. And we were very like into Jeff Mills waveform transmission or R and S records or um, 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 uh, I, I I remember when And Andrew bought that um, that pink record from Underworld Res, and it was a track that that always haunted us in a positive way. And yes, uh, 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 house music work, the label work, and um, I can remember how many times we listened to Southside from Dave Clark and and um, um, Basic Channel and all this. And we, we bought record, records at Hardwax in Berlin, famous record store, and, and important records in Essen. And um, it was we spent we spent all of our money buying records and and driving in around uh, driving around listening to artists and we even were into that drum and bass thing i can remember like a jungle we were listening we were driving to bochum to planet in bochum to listen to adam x who was playing there and um i think it's um and then a third man came to the crew um, uh, jackson michael bellina who joined us and uh yeah and we became close friends a great team and then we did uh um um the first uh, successful phil Fultner records the first successful mogwai records and um uh one of the tracks by mogwai it, uh, you know why was picked by a british producer um, um from xenomania his name was brian higgins and he did uh um, belief for sugar babes uh, for 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 share it was his first big hit belief and he was um uh, uh he was based in westrom and kent in a farmhouse with a farmhouse lot with lots of studios in it and um in the song with share i mean the hit that if you believe in love after love the one where they use the um yes quarter on her voice is yes. this a picture around the time when that happened oh yes it was <laughs> Is, is, that, uh, is that the right? Is that the right song? The Sugar Babes was that the record they used? Uh, uh, they uh, yeah, the bass for um, I think for something kind of ooh, uh -huh. uh, was uh, uh, they and the original song was from uh, the the one that we did uh, with Mogwai for Mogwai. You know why? And that and uh, by that by that record we became recognized by him and his team. And he invited us to come there and reproduce the song so he could use it for his for for the sugar babes lp and then we started to work together more closely and uh, we did some productions for him and there was some 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 writing stuff to do and um yeah one thing came to another and then i was i i learned how that i have like um the ability to write top lines and um and that it was my thing and uh, finding melodies, finding like easy lyrics and the lyrics and good, good lyrics to sing along. And um, yeah, and that was my thing. And I did that for a couple of years. And um, I think it was like 2014 or 2013 when I really came back to, 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 to put that aside and really concentrate on Phil Fortner again mm -hmm. and doing Phil Fortner singles, doing Phil Fortner singles. Wait, before we go that far, Yep. We also have some in between stuff. Let's talk about what happened in between. So we talk about, you know, you have really good success. You got <laughs> Miami Pop Collection. Okay, you have. You're waiting to become the Phil Full Nun that everybody knows now. What a cute <laughs> kid! Oh my God! How this goes from the very start. 
That's the kid dreaming about what it's going to be like to be the superstar Phil Fulner. <laughs> You're in the group charts with records. And, but, and look at that. Above Madonna, Phil Fulner has a number one at the <laughs> top. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, you know, and let's talk about this. You know, as you're going along, you're learning about Love Parade. You're at the beginning of Love Parade. With Mogwai together. Yeah. yeah. I mean, these guys, are, were in. they were in the trench. You know, mm -hmm. as this thing was getting bigger, they were right there living it. You know? Yeah. yeah. I think it was 93 where the, where the picture was taken. Yeah. They were on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, the, in, okay. They, on the Trendline magazine, they were very like, um, into that scene, but they had to change their name because Trendline, it, it, it appears that it was the name of a wrestling magazine. That's right. So they came from Trendline to Raveline, you know, and that must have Raveline. been the Raveline truck on the Love Parade. Yeah. And we were, I think, uh, um, uh, uh, Andre, he already had a driving license and he had a car, an old Mercedes Coupe. It was amazing. <laughs> we went there and there were like traffic jam, traffic all over the, the, the traffic was stuck, you know, on the autobahn and everybody, but it's doing an autobahn rave and, you know, and, and having a party. And we didn't even, we didn't even have a hotel. We slept at Humboldthafen, an old harbor. And, and in the car, like it was freezing, it was cold, but we had the time of our lives, you know? That's what I'm talking about. See, things like that. People don't understand that feeling unless you're there. You had, yeah. you, you, you're actually in the wilderness. It's like Woodstock for electronic music. You know, you're right in the middle of all Yeah, that. you name it. Yes, it was like that, yeah. The Woodstock, I mean, Love Parade is the most, uh, most sensational, most important thing to ever happen to electronic music, to have that free open air rave like that in the middle of the wind, you know? Yeah, it made it, it made an impact on, on the, I mean, on the whole world regarding that kind of music and regarding that kind of culture, you know? And it was, yeah, it was like, it was like Woodstock. It was like the hippie thing. And, and um, so the hippie thing turned out, turned out in a different way. But this music is still on, is still alive. It became, it became like an establishment, like 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 an, a, a, a part of the culture that you can't erase anymore because it became this, and it became more or less an everyday thing. What I really, what I think it's it's amazing when you regard how it started off, you know, in in the creative cells, and um, yeah, but it became so big. And I can remember, I was looking down. And you know the, the 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 street where the love parade took place. It had like a like a like a little slope, and um, hard to recognize. And I was I was hanging in the back of that truck, and looking down the street down down the alley of love, you know, and looking at that one million people. And that was the moment that I felt that there is something very very special taking place right now, you know. And I and that was amazing. And when you when you are there and you feel in a way what's happening now, not years later when you reminisce like a time capsule, and then oh it must have now I realized realized that it was the moment that was it was a very special moment. It took place there in on that very moment. Life for me, yeah, of course, life changing moments. You never forget that. It's another moment where you that's in the in in as I call it, sketching in your brain. You never forget that unless you mm -hmm. experience it, you don't understand. How does one get this, for example, to become no. a resident of the space terrace, which is you know, it's a big that's a big honor. I, yeah. I was never, I have never been a resident there, oh, but I would I guess I played no. there a couple of times. You know, and it or the mixer. Oh, that's so old school. <laughs> look at um, him. Look at the picture. Really good. You see what I'm saying? Look, he's the handsome guy with the vinyl records, no CDs. Look at it very clearly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Take a good look. So that was like um, there was a lot of Cosmo parties taking place there. Cosmo was the label of the hour back in the days, uh, with with me. And like, as you mentioned, Tom Novi and Mogwai and Tom Craft and Danny Koenig and DJ Sandy versus House Trap. And they did some parties there. And uh, that was uh, when I started off playing at Pasha. And um, because uh, 
the, there were big parties there and you can make yourself it was always the thing making yourself seen there and taking place there you could recognize you can get recognized by other clubs and by other promoters and you we had a big time there and i think obviously we did a good job and so we went to another club and then i must when i when i reminisce i must have played on, on in almost every club there in amnesia even at kilometer cinco and um um am5 yes Can yeah it was like it was an amazing time even on formentera at the tipic or magu and i remember we went there in, at, at the magu and on formentera the small island um, um uh, close to ibiza and uh it was the summer when uh um show me love came up when show me love was released by robin s and they played it i think they must have played it five or six times at night in their club and everybody and we, we were going nuts standing outside smoking fortunas you know and drinking san miguel and we, we had that song we're playing once again in the club everybody was running in see that organ boom everybody's running in what is that amazing is that it was electric it was electrifying let me show everybody what that looked like back then he gave us some beautiful video of himself playing i i don't have the audio everybody so don't ask me what the audio is because of copyright permission problems but we got we have an awesome video here and phil playing at space look at him in the glory days when space ruled the nation of the visa incredible he, he was playing you make me feel mighty real unfortunately we had to mute that <laughs> but you can at least see space during the day was the party to be at i mean those that remember it was an incredible credible time and in those days people party 24 hours a day that was the way it was on that island. That was a true, true, true party island in every sense of the word. And to be able to be asked as a guest DJ or if you became a resident DJ at some of these clubs, it was it, it was like nothing other than you've ever experienced. I mean, Phil, I tell you, coming from Germany, I come from America, stepping on that island is a whole different level, right? Phil, complete different level completely i mean you can have you can have a great time there just relaxing right and you, and you can yeah you can now even more than 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 any than any time before it's it's so entertaining but it's still um there are still places that i used to love about ibiza and um and um if it went if it was too much we went just we just got went to formentera to chill there you know and and it would and it this was also a completely different thing it was a different smell you know it's all the pine woods and all you know the the, the noises the sound and you can sometimes you can only hear the wind and um and it, what i love about ibiza is that you can participate and you can you can roll with it you can go to the party from nine to five and uh, 24 7 <laughs> and but you can leave this whole you can leave it behind and we were like um, um last week or the weekend before we went to um um we had a party there at a friend's house and then um, we were like and, and it was it turned out that it was, it was a boat party and then the next day we spent some time on the house and there was music playing all the time. And then we said, okay, that's enough. We need to have a rest. And then we went to the Silencio beach where no, no music was playing. And then the old feeling came back to me and uh, that you can go to, to places on Ibiza where, is there, where there is nothing. There is only the noise of nature, you know, and some wind and the sea. And that's what I, that's what I, in the end, I enjoy even more. Sure, sure. I mean, of course, this is your job. This is not you going there as a clubber for a weekend and then go home and go back to work and, you know, at a, like an architect. 
Mm. You're doing your architecture for all week long and you run into Ibiza. This is what you're an architect of the dance floor. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you something about this. Cause you know, you, there's a couple parts of you, you know, here I mentioned in the beginning of the show about modeling. Oh, well, yeah. What, what drew you to the model? Did you decide to leave music behind for a minute to try something different? No, I think you decide to stay in it and do this as well. What was the story behind that? It was it it, it happened uh, that these all these things happened um, and more or less at the same time. I was into I was all, I was making music. I was working as a DJ frequently and trying to 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 sell or to to, to bring and release on productions my own stuff and together with Mogwai and um, um, uh, studying, you know, and there was so much energy. I had so much energy and there was no sleep needed. We were just hustling and bustling, you know, and um, uh, when I, when we had that first success, it came to us like, yeah, like a, like the lightning struck in 1989. Of when, when I had that first hit record, the final, the Captain Future theme, you know, with that manga video. And it went to the top of the charts from zero. And um, uh, be, uh, during that time, I was already into modeling. And um, I was my ex-girlfriend from uh, from that back in the days. She brought me to the, to her agency where she was working as a model. And I had some smaller jobs and it went quite well. I was traveling around a bit and going to go and seize. And I had a, I collected a great book and a great set card. And it, it was very, it, it was good money, you know, not hard work, not really what I meant was not really what you would you say when you have hard work. It was easy money for easy work as for me, you know, personally, and not easy money. money. For, for 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 easy work and um, um, and then um, when this success came it went uh, they booked me you know from from for for that for the bigger bigger companies for Levi's or Caterpillar and Bruno Banani and um, and uh, it's uh, it happened more or less at the same time and it it participated from each other. You know, when I had that, uh, when it began uh, that I was successful in music, they start to book me even more and I got more money from the modeling. And um, right. but it only for a couple of years, I think five or six or seven years. And then I didn't make new Polaroids and I didn't work on my set card anymore because I was so much into music. I was so into music, so into, into traveling for DJ gigs and I was not going to the gym regularly anymore. So um, I began with that later on again, but um, um, there were only a few shows that I did and a few like catalog jobs. And, um, but um, I'm still, I think I have still have a set card uh, in an agency, but I, my first, my, my, my last, last job I did must have been like 10 years ago. It just went off, you know. Right, because anyway. yeah, because when you mentioned you were putting everything, everything back together, together before I stopped you, we went back a little bit in time. You go to twenty fourteen. I know there's a time in between that music changed for everybody. You know, the younger EDM stars were coming up from Holland, the Dutch DJs like Avicii, and all these songs are becoming the new sound. Mm. You know, and actually. David Guetta's first album, 2006, changes so many things. Mm. Um, you know, the Robin S. sound and all the house music and disco house is kind of all going away. Mm. You know, where does that, where do you find yourself between those years? Because a lot of us were trying to find where we belong. You know, some of us are no longer in the business, some of us went on to do other things. Yeah, we did stay in it. We we had a lot of we spent a lot of time, um, and it was uh, um, we had we had a good time producing the stuff for Mogwai. 
with Mogwai, Jackson and me. We did the stuff on Mogwai, which it was more like um, more like uh, the rougher stuff. And so I could concentrate on this. But um, I changed, I, musically, I changed a bit. And but was that was the year or that was the years that I that I was that we were like very into producing for other people, writing and producing and doing backings for other artists and starting off making our own parties. And so we were into the music business, but not doing that much singles anymore. That there are a few Phil Fortner singles in that time, but the direction for me wasn't clear in a way. I enjoyed the, the, the because I had so many influences when it comes to electronic music. Like we were listening to the to to the very very housey house stuff, but we also listened to the and we had we I can remember we were on the one of the very first Maydays and in at Halle Weissensee in Berlin and we listened to Euromasters. Um, today it's called Hardstar. Back in the days it was called Gaba music. Gaba. It, yes, Gaba. Honey, Gaba. BPM. Yes. <laughs> and it was it was like I can remember Mockham Records and Hard uh, Dark Raver and all these guys, and it was it, it the hardcore stuff. It was it was really fun. We enjoyed it. We we um, we I think we um, it was so much fun to see those guys performing on stage, you know, and 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 even that was an influence in a way. And to find your way, and especially when when it when it and we did we did the producing. For, for 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 pop music and that also is a very strong influence and then you end up and and, and say to yourself so what you're going to be what do you want to do and how do you want to sound like or what is your style finding yourself you mentioned that you know yes. especially when you have so many influences yes. and that was quite a hard time and it's it still is to find your 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 kind of signature your sound and especially when you have when so many things are so inspiring and there is something that has an maybe a, a, a song or a band that has such, that has such an impact on you and you say okay this must be it so this is it i want to sound like this and i want to go more in that direction and a couple of weeks later you hear a different thing and that's also a major impact yeah you know, on your creativity sure and and how to bring that together you know, and it's and it's it's of course it's it's a thing of art, but it's a market thing too. So you, and I, it never was my wish to only produce music for myself. I wanted to do it to do it for for the people, and right. I wanted the success. I wanted the records to be successful. And so you think, okay, I want to excogitate. I want to bring myself into. I bring my really core into that into that song. But I all, but I also want it to be successful, you know. And how to bring that together, and that is like that can be complicated, and that isn't the major way. And the people always say when it's when you do what you love, when you one hundred percent do what you love, you can, it, it it will be successful somehow, more or less, you know. But with a bit of luck, yes, with luck too. And that's it, and with a little bit of calculation, maybe, <laughs> you know. And um, that's what I wanted. That was all, always on my mind to bring that together of, of functionality and soul, you know, and and really, yeah, and keeping the music real, but uh, but it it uh, and expecting some kind of success. I got you. I got mm -hmm. that. You know, again, things changed and. You know, who would have ever thought, I'll bring up this next segment, who would have ever thought we had this man on last week, Simon Dunmore would have created something called, you know, Glitterbox and helped bring disco back after all that heavy music mm -hmm. between EDM and then, you know, Steve Angelo and all, you know, Swedish House Mafia and all that sound coming out from Holland and Europe. And American house music that we knew, the soulful house or the disco house was completely like, it was there, but it was so underground. Yeah. You know, where it wasn't, where 10 years prior was commercial hits. So, you know, of course, you're lucky enough to get a chance to play 
with the glitter box family mm. in uh in uh in the hotel shanghai in essen with musi and them of course and i had fell in love with a track you you know you produced uh two years ago that disco track uh and, take me yeah i loved it love what you did with it and and it inspired me oh thank you that's track. amazing you know, it was an inspiration again because you know again i was like do we do this? Mm -hmm. Do you want to do this, Lenny? Do you feel up to it? Because you go to yourself after a while. You know, if you don't have the people around you with the cheering, it's hard mm -hmm. to stay focused. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, when you uh, it's it's a thing when you listen to that music so for so many times, and you and you played that music. For so long, not that you get tired of that kind of music, but um, there is a strong. Sometimes there's a strong pull in in, in other directions, and you see that that music it it's, it comes on vogue, and it, and then it fades away again. I mean, it's history repeating, and that is also a good reason. I mean, it's the right thing. Simon did the right thing, the right thing at the right time. He saw it coming back, and um, or even he might not. Well, but he reinitiated that kind of his music. Philosophy was people were coming in from the UK. He knew that were older, mm -hmm. that were not really into that younger sound, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he was like every week telling them, "I don't know where to send you." So then it came to his mind saying, "Let me start some," because he had defected in the house going at the same time, which is entertaining the younger kids. Mm -hmm. The thing was, what happened to all the people that were dancing in the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s? They want to go back out again. Some of them, yeah. I call it the circle of life. They got married, have children. Some got divorced, are coming back. Some <laughs> of the children are grown up and they want to have a piece of that fun of their heart again. They're young, you know, when I was a young guy or a young woman. And that music helps you remember. You know, and it, it was like when it when look when it began, I was playing at Space as well. Mm -hmm. I was a resident for uh, for the Cafe Olay on the Saturdays, and I was thinking, hmm, yeah. I don't know if this is going to work. Uh -huh. But Simon Dumo said, the first five years, five made no money, all losses on the visa. <laughs> I so didn't know that. Five years, nobody remembers the bad part. They only okay. remember the glory now. It's like yeah. the, the, the glory of disco is everywhere. But the beginning, first five years, no money made. So you have oh, to man. have a lot of passion in this game to stay in it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It never works without that, you know. And maybe you have to stay focused. You have to stay on it. And if if you and if you when you see it growing, you know, and there's a glimpse of that you that you 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 see that that there is that there is a progress and even for 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 years and when you see how that thing can evolve and how uh, that how people respond to that and when you when you have an idea and go into the market like very very sharp and you go and you cut into the market with something that is that nobody else is doing you have some kind of a chance uh, to to get recognized because it's a it's a it's a singularity thing it's 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 that no what nobody else does and then you get recognized and when you do it in such a loud way like he did and he does you know and it's only a matter of time until people come and recognize what you're doing there you know and he and the the, the music uh, was was turning back into that house direction and into that into that disco direction and like Sometimes I think that these that the decade is a good decade for classics, and uh, I think it started off with um, and even before uh, the 2000. I think it was. Look how John Travolta came back, and he was so off, and he was so on like back in the days, and everybody was travolting, and then he was the people were so over of like Bee Gees. Bee Gees were banned from the radio because nobody could have Bee Gees anymore, and because it was so over. And then he was off and he was he didn't know what to do. And then he came back with little small roles and on the movies. And then a guy like like um, 
Quentin Tarantino, he came and pulls that 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 guy out of the dark, you know, and says, "This is the guy that I want," and this is still a superstar. And um, he was he was a guy from now, picking up the guy from the, from then, like Sunmore does with uh, with Jelly Bean and Casey Sledge, you know, and all these 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 heroes from back in the days. And he pulled him back into the light, and he came back to stay. And then he became a superstar, and and again for the second time, you know. And this is um, um, you 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 are big, and then your time has gone. Uh, but it's always a chance, you know, to come back. And and well, he did in a major way. And that's know? where it comes to me now, saying what you said. Ready? Mm -hmm. 2014 is a transcending year for you. Why? I stopped you at the time. You said I was doing something in 2014 to now. What were you creating? What was the mindset for you? Was this it? Creating this? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, I'm putting it together in pieces now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, 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 you made your, you did your homework. Very well. Well, I, um, uh, I started off Fultner Plus. That was the thing before Phil Slicks. And then um, I um, I remember I started off in at, actually at Hotel Shanghai. Uh, Fultner Plus, I think it was 2001 or two, no, 2003 or 2008 or, in, or even before sometimes. I have a poster and an old school and a, and a flyer from that back in the day, so I have to, I have to take a look when it started off uh, for the first time. I had Ian Pooley there and Ali from Ali from T Schwartz. Oh, Ali, Ali, and oh my God, from the Red Bull, the Red Dog days. Oh yeah, yeah. and, ah. and Ali and Basti, everybody, Ali and Basti. Yeah, very very cool guys. And um, can I say something about Ali and Basti? Go for it. So before they became Techno Kings, okay, mm -hmm. they had this small club. Everybody, I played there. Tony Humphreys, everybody played. This club was as small as a, like a little store. The, the Gum Club in, in Hamburg. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Red Dog? Right. Uh, what was it? Red Dog or something like that. Red. Red in, what? What town? Maybe Hamburg. I, I Hamburger. Okay. I I can remember this that um there was back there there was the front where Boris was doing his thing. Not Boris's thing, yeah. No, yes. Boris, but, but he was also playing at the gum club. We we um, we have to um uh, I have to check that. I have to check that. But I think really? it was everybody was, was yo, yo, this is crazy. <laughs> soulful black house music i mean like new jersey new york style these two guys Steve schwartz playing ali and basti crazy in those days yeah amazing that's it i couldn't when he said it and he had them in, of course in 24 but back in the day in the 90s mm. what a party like yeah. my one with booby m1 Oh my God! All those clubs were the bomb. But anyway, sorry for jumping on your parade. Twenty fourteen. Mark, Mark Eins in 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 Nuremberg and um um and uh Kaffee 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 Europa in Bielefeld. They were famous German house clubs and 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 yeah, a, a, a gum club. A lot of things happened there. And um. Okay, 2014. So I started off with Fultner Plus, and then I, um, uh, my my booking agency, they were like they had like, a, uh, they were not so so. I think I can't really remember what 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 pulled us away from there. And but there was a Phil Slicks. We had a break for a couple of years, and then we came back. I think in 2013 or 2012 with Phil Slicks. And I wanted to do my own party again and with the kind of guests that I wanted and um, the kind of style that I wanted to present. And it had to take place on a, on a small scale, like some kind of downplaying, like the, 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 like the thing we, we saw, like bringing big artists to a small place for a small crowd, you know, to make it become a real clubby feeling. 
and then um, um, you know when you're in that scene and you have a, a lot of colleagues and you know everybody and you know uh, um, let's say you're not a lot you know a lot of people a lot of a lot of the big timers or some of the big timers it's easier for you to invite that people to come to play on a club than a club promoter you know or a club owner you can always say come on it's we only have a small fee to pay but it's a great place and when you get one of the big ones and everybody sees what's taking what's happening there what's taking place there it's also it attracts the other djs to yes. play there. and i said oh i know this place who this and this and this guy have played there so i can play there too because it's yes the crowd must be amazing and everybody was there and so it becomes a big place it becomes naturally and so we started yeah like like um uh, i think we started off with guys like oh with rubber sonic and butch and um and um um yeah, with Tino, Papadisco Machine, Lawrence Wardy Live, and Ten Snake, and Loco Dice, and The Blessed Madonna, and Sinti, and uh, Perel, and all these guys. Not only house music, it was right. also very, very electronica. Mm -hmm. And we had DJ Kotze playing there, and we had uh, Nina Kravitz playing there, and um, a lot of queer uh, content, a lot of uh, uh, like, like, um, we are artists like um, um, Hercules and Love Affair and um, Boy George, and we brought Boy George there. And it, yeah, we had a great time. And it's still a very, very, very busy place. And Kai Shanghai, who's the owner of this place, is like um, is a great presenter and uh, of of this club, a great ambassador for the scene mm -hmm. and for the people who who go there and. Um, and we still close friends, and uh, then it became on one stage it became bigger, and I had to uh, the opportunity to host uh, um, my own stage at Parukaville Festival, and I had international guests, and uh, the idea was to to bring uh, 360 creative degrees there, like actors who can play a good DJ set or 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 singer songwriters. Would you bring Iris? Would you bring Iris Elba there? Uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but I thought but, you, said, you said actors because he's DJing. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah, and he's a good DJ. Yes, very. And we he's had, really could play. He he really play music. Yeah, no, he's very good. He said he has always been a DJ. That's what he said on a on a, on an interview, and that he was always been DJing. And we had guys there like Skin from Skandinansi. She's an excellent DJ, and. Um, some really famous guys from Germany, like Lezol, great singer-songwriter, and Paulina Rozinski, um, a great creative girl and a great artist, and Philip Poisel and Jan Delay, who's one of the one of the head honchos of Germany's most influential hip hop act from back in the days, and still is. And that was the idea to bring to bring artists into a small club or into into a DJ venue um the people that are not really known for 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 djs but more for going onto a stage and with a guitar and playing for thirty thousand people and then bring to these guys to an intimate place and make them play a dj set and not an edm wow. or dj set but really sophisticated techno and house music and they really did and some of these or most of these of these creative guys of the singer songwriters are actually really good djs they have their controllers at home you know they 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 are collecting stuff and and they are really really able to play really good dj sets and that's what i wanted to express and that's what i wanted to to bring out with phil slicks and that's a great idea because it, it needed it you need to do something a little bit different than what everybody else is doing in order to be successful. And that's what makes you stand out. One step beyond, yeah, yeah. Yeah, otherwise, why go to Phil's party if I can go to Butch down the road, you know, or whatever, or, mm -hmm. you know. But do you particularly like better playing for more intimate or you like playing for a big events? What, what do you prefer better? Well, I like both actually, and um, there's nothing that can compare with an intimate club set or with a clubby setting on a on a larger scale, like 
uh, like Kiesgrube or, or a famous brand in, in, in Germany, Tom Preuss, um, who really brings a lot of big artists to 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 Germany like uh, uh, like he did recently um, Jamie Jones and he brought Peggy Goo here and um, I was playing for him with Antim in a in a mid venue like a, a couple of hundred people but it had a, like a club appearance and um, uh, um, narrow ceiling you know and uh, so you can play on a festival and it can feel like a club gig when you're close to the people that's what i like and that's always a bit of a pity when you come to a large festival you have that big stage and you go like 30 meters back and then there's the dj booth so and you uh, that's okay because everybody has to see you from out there so you have to be like a little bit backwards you know but uh it's not that and you can you can even make that an intimate place. I used to go for like, grab a bottle of Jägermeister and go to you know to the crash barriers on the front row and fed everybody with Jägermeister, and to get in touch with the people, yeah, to do something intimate, and um, um, and to to correspond and in a way with the people, and that's much that you can do it much better in a club, because you are so close. You can look in everybody's face, and the people can look in your face. And there is always some kind of an intimate interaction going on. And so I like both. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing feeling to play for a couple of thousand of, of listeners and, 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 and people. And um, it's, like, it's like a flight to the moon. But I also like playing on, 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 on a small venue and, you know, uh, getting real sweaty. And that's because that's the, the places where we started off. Or where I started off. Groove Can Club I, in, in, in Groove Club in Gelsenkirchen and Warehouse in Cologne, amazing places. There you go. Mm. Can I ask you your involvement with this gentleman, this famous gentleman from Germany? Wolfgang oh, Klaffwerk. of Kraftwerk. Kraftwerk, yeah. everyone. Kraftwerk. She. So the former drummer of Kraftwerk. And he's a he's an amazing, he's a great guy. A very gentle and he's a gentleman and he is an amazing storyteller and he has this um this project music soldat music soldier and where he does like soundscapes and a real program and um and he was and there was also a uh, um like a part where he was playing records where he was djing and he used to play a few records and we met a couple of times and, and uh, it's sometimes unexpected and was really really fun and it ended up we were sitting together for hours just talking about music and musical heritage and he was talking about the the Kraftwerk days and yeah it's amazing and um yeah we we're not finished with with it, with each other maybe something is coming up in the future let's see <laughs> But he's a great guy, amazing. Phil, where do you see yourself going the next part of this journey? You know, where's the next part to the Phil Fulton experience? Well, uh, the, the, the next part of the Phil Fulton experience. Stay tuned. Um, <laughs> sounds like that. Stay tuned for more coming. Stay tuned for more. Stay with us. Um, um, actually, we are in, in uh, right now in a process of um, shaping the 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 brand a bit shaping the ci a bit and um and doing taking what's best from the existing phil fortner and and um you know bring it into something bring it together with some new aspects that i was thinking about for for a long time now and um and uh we have I think very strong records coming up and um, and some very uh, um, amazing um, um, collabs that I am that I was recently working on and still working on we are still in the process of, of finishing these collaborations and and um, it gets a little more colorful and um, um, I can I think in a couple of weeks I can tell you much more about that because then I have like a, some sort of a concept, yeah. But there is something coming up. That's I know that what everybody hates. 
big things are coming up, big things in the headlights, but they really are. <laughs> you have to, you have to dream. You have to work towards something. It truly is architecture because you're engineering the next steps of what this journey is going to be for you. You know, mm -hmm. each piece is another part to hopefully having a massive hit or touring a huge tour. You know, everyone, it's, you know, it's not as easy as it used to be do very little and big and big return. Now, the way it works is you have to do a hell of a lot of work for very little return because of the social media content. Mm -hmm. Does that bother you at all, the social media? Because, you know, we all look at it differently. Some people say, hmm, some of those people don't deserve to have that level of success because they're not very talented or are they just hating mm -hmm. what do you think what's your feel on it well, first i have to say i'm not the guy to hate well you um, know what I, mean? I say hating meaning you know looking like you don't deserve that in your yeah mind. i mean i know what you mean yeah, yeah yeah um well i think it's um art can find its expression in many ways and sometimes it's sometimes it's, it's the easy way when you come like a like a TikTok phenomena or or um, we live in these days of of strong social media appearances and and of, um, and of people getting famous without skills and I think it let's see how it turns out in the end and I think um, some of these guys that I that. I haven't heard of uh, on a musical side that only appeared to or that only came in my into my in my radar or in my focus uh, by um, by record by on, on social media. Some of them I got to know and that are really really nice persons working really really hard and are actually quite good musicians. But I always uh, but I also recognize it the other way, the different way, and actually I. I was lately. I was so busy with my own stuff and thinking about what was I, what what will I do, what I'm doing, that I that I can hardly contribute to to, or that I can hardly think what I am actually thinking about those people. You know, and it's hard for me to tell. I just recognize it, and and but it, but it doesn't give me it doesn't give me love or give me hate. You know, sometimes I sit there and said, oh, my, that's ridiculous. I mean, and that must be only a fun thing, you know. And on the other side, it came, it, uh, um, it's, all these things are evolving. It become, it didn't, these, these phenomena didn't come up overnight. So you, you have a way or there is some time you, you, you see these things coming, especially when you are in the industry for such a long time, like we are, you know. And you see those trends and you see and you can understand why these people get famous just because there are stars on TikTok or on Instagram or like they are influencers. But I think everybody, every time has his own stars, whatever that means. Mm. And um, things are come and go and it's, it's always history repeating. And I can... I, I have no exact vision where this thing will end. What I can say is that sometimes it's really it's tough to 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 really to um, to um, to make yourself seen on social media the way that you want to appear yeah. from your heart, you know, mm -hmm. or you like you all. Maybe if you're lucky, you have like a deputy who is exactly. Who has exactly your style and is has the way to say what you want to say you know but um you don't have to care about it because someone else is doing that for you you know and it's doing very very good and i think that's you can be very lucky if you find somebody who can do your social media work and you can focus on your music but that's the more it, it's at the end it's all about the music that's what makes you famous you know and when you get you get played your music gets played on the radio because it's good I don't know if it's good music, but because the record is successful, not really because you are successful as an influencer, you know, they have to like the music. But it seems more like these days, it's more about the influential part of it than it is about the musicality. That's right. 
that, that definitely that's uh, but i think um um in our universe of of electronic music and of electronic artists there's a strong sense of keeping it real and supporting the real people you see what happened to stella bossi you know and uh, like a like a tiktok i mean it's it's it seems to be like a thing that humans do they love to build their heroes and they love to to dismantle their heroes you know and and and, and destroy them and and um i think that's what taken place here and there uh, here and there and now and then and um um i think uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the the electronic music scene is very supportive on people who are um even if they come up really strong in a very short period like fisher did or stuff and but um i didn't know i actually i i have to confess i don't know how famous i was before his his hits his hit records and but um I think they have. Uh, there is a strong sense of supporting real people, whatever that means, mm. and supporting real artists. And don't get uh, some of these TikTok artists get too strong. They get strong, definitely, but on an on a on a on a different stage, on a different scale, and um, and um, they uh, and but the the thing that we do, electronic music and house music, I think it's a different thing. It's some. It's hard to explain. And I have to think, and I, especially when we have that conversation now, I recognize that I, that I don't, didn't think of a lot of things that took place in recent history because I was so busy thinking about myself, you know, that sometimes I can't really contribute to, can't you contribute real substantial stuff to, uh, to or, 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 or feature my position that I have because I was not thinking about this and that phenomena. I just recognize oh. it, but I was I would, wasn't really thinking. I wasn't really reflecting about this. And that's you know? and that's what happens because you, you're so busy being in your own. Like I call it, it's like your own goldfish bowl, swimming mm -hmm. around trying to be seen, make sure everybody sees what you're doing. That there's thousands and thousands of people doing that now, and it's like wow. I mean, it's a, it's. There and you always do this. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I, I, what I try to do. Is... Let me teach you. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I mean, what I do is, I, 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 every day I try to look left and right and beyond my horizon. Yeah, especially when you are a music producer and you, and you are, and I am interested in every kind of music. So that's why I take a look at at. at I, I check Spotify. I check. Uh, I check Apple Music. I check the song starts. I check Beatport. I check. I check uh, a Bandcamp and Amazon and whatever you know. And but um, I let it. I let it come and let it go through me. Some yep. things stay with me. The others just pass me by. You know. I try to see what's going on out there. You know. More. more not. More the. Less politics. More music. You know. Yeah, but so many, so many universes beyond my own horizon. You know, like there are some some artists I never heard about that are in my genre and very big in my genre, and I some I see them on 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 the flyer on a festival lineup in the building, and I go to that um, and there are Instagram super or TikTok superstars I never heard of before. You know, because I, there are so many of them. You know, on my algorithm they didn't it it didn't got these artists to me it um you know insta okay. facebook doesn't okay. bring these artists to me okay here's the question when you see these tiktok stars or instagram stars and you never really heard of them do you think a lot of it is pumped up with money marketing money to buy fake a fake audience or do you think it's legitimate real well if you and you can sometimes you can tell uh, on the interaction that takes place there, and you can see if that's. I mean, you can construct an artist and construct uh, um, 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 or you can bring uh, with money uh, an artist to people, and then 
it has to go by itself. You know, you can invest a lot of money to yep. get people on the scene and then they have to perform. Yeah. Sometimes, you know. And I think it's both. I think it's 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 uh, you can create an artist out of nothing with money. We all know that it, that it can happen and it happened a couple of times and it will happen in future. And I can and I think on the other hand there is also a, it's there are also artists that are really came up and are really supported 100% by their fans and these and maybe there are some they they bought some fans in the beginning to make it appear bigger you know but i think it's both i'm sure it's both yeah because many times trust me even i look and i go who the hell is this person having <laughs> a million followers it's like you're not on tv you're not a massive name mm -hmm. i have to say something doesn't seem right sometimes i mean when you see when 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 you buy it insta followers for example and uh, you come to a certain amount you reach a certain amount that it um it, it's a track it, and when you have the appearance that people are really interacting with comments and you know and there are it seems to be like there are real people doing the comments mm -hmm. it attracts on you and you must and it, i know what it what it does to you I'm, I'm you think okay this must be somebody real and he has and maybe it didn't it didn't came to me earlier but this has to be somebody and from that stage on the people are following more naturally right you can you can push it to a certain stage with an amount of money and then best case it runs for itself because mm -hmm. it attracts people just sure. because of the numbers in the yeah. algorithms because the algorithms are out there um and everything is flowing, it seems to bring more. As they say, success breeds success. That's what I meant. Is the same as the algorithm world? Maybe it does. Maybe if, you know, maybe if house music got that kind of love, like the other electronic musics, maybe you would have, you would see those numbers for everyone. You know, but mm -hmm. you don't see those kind of numbers in the house music world. Unless it's like a black ma uh, black coffee, for example, or you know, there's a few guys that have records that crossed into pop status type records, and they've gained tremendous amount of followers. But most DJs are, don't have that kind of level of success. Mm. All Cox's numbers, and you know, they, those fans are big. You know, he's got yeah. a big fan base, and a lot of it sometimes blends to be more techno or electronic music enthusiasts then say proper house music you know mm -hmm. well this 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 hard stuff is really really strong you know oh and because it, it, it and i remember when we we had fun we were dancing we were having a party to that hot stuff you know because it was uh, we were soaking up every kind of electronic music back in the days like i said and and it's so big now and and one of the the aspects is that these sex positive thing you know and and this everybody can be itself and can express their you know their their sexual behavior in a way you know when it comes to this sex positive electronic very hard kind of kind of thing you can recognize it by 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 how the people dress you know totally. and what they like and they and finally they can they can be their self and express their self in a way you know uh, that they that they that they want to express their yes. their 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 sex and their and their and and their their very intimate parts because the music is a, and and even the clubs are and the the whole scene is a platform for that you know you can live those those private parts right with the with the music and that's why it's I think that's that's a major reason why it's so big and it, it of course it's fun you know. Yep. And uh, you can have a great time to that sound, and and uh, some of these, some of these phenomena, some of these aspects that I mean, even if the people dance that shuffle dance, you know, that techno dance, mm -hmm. when like back in the days when it came up, these we were laughing at these guys dancing these dance, and today is, when today is absolutely okay, you know, you have the the people on 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 the cool, on, on some of the festivals, the festival dancers they do shuffling on the stage. 
you know. And I say, and every time I see it, I say, oh my goodness. But back in the days, you know, we were just throwing coins at those people. But that you know, that was a different thing. I mean, everybody, everything is okay for everybody. Everybody can do what he loves, especially when when it comes to these kinds of music, because that's that's um, that was uh, that is a, a major part, a major expression of that music. Do what you like and dance how you like and be how you like. Do you know? Um, do what you like. Digital, digital underground. Do what you like. <laughs> and I think um, um, it's uh, when it, a phenomena comes up so strong, it can be gone very quick. But I think um, um, so many people are have spent so much time with that music and that kind of fashion and expression. And it even takes place, and you know, Bergheim is a, it's an international thing. You know, it's a fashion thing. You know, and there is in on on the, you know, on the catwalks of of, of Milan, we have that techno style people walking on 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 the catwalk. You know, and it and it comes well, like a good point. Good point because fashion came from the nightclubs. Yes. Yeah. That's where innovation takes place. You know, and then in the it. Yeah, and in the dark, yes, and so it became such a big thing. I don't know if it, it if if it will be gone very early. I think it will stay for a couple of time, or for it will stay for a time. And I'm excited to what's coming next. So if we have that wheel, if we regard it like we do always, like like repeating. So, what do you think will be the next thing? Uh, in the cycle, in the I think the 1990s sound is already starting to make its way through. Yeah, it, it already is. Like you know, like people. But it hasn't, like, but it hasn't peaked yet. It's still mm -hmm. just like I think so too. yeah. It's like banging the door. Boom. Mm -hmm. Boom. The door is gonna when that door opens up, it'll be like crazy. But I think that's just listening to the music coming out, seeing the people playing the sets, or you are playing those records from that era. People go crazy. You know, yeah, yeah. I don't see these new records and not putting new records down because I love making new records like you do too. The question is, these new records that everyone's making, are they going to hold 20 and 30 years from now to become the golden classics? I the golden think. classics classics. Yeah, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? I don't, I don't know if it's going to have that same staying power. Mm -hmm. Like the way a finally record has or... Bucket heads, or you know, all the big big hits that were through the nineties to the two thousands. Yeah, because that was an innovation. I mean, that's just just recycle, you know. And even if the young people don't get it, that what what is absolutely okay. I can remember when we had that when in in, in the nineties when we were into that uh, um, acid jazz thing when Jamiroquai came up and Incognito and, and stuff, and we were all going crazy to the disco music and you know with the with the with these. The, the club we were and you know and how we dressed and my mama was just laughing at me and said oh no we just brought that behind us and now it's starting all over again you know and and in a way when with with uh, uh sampling all these these records uh, we recycled it all we also but it was the first kind of recycling we did it was the very start of sampling when uh, uh, when you uh, regard when it comes to electronic music it took all it already took place in in when and in, in hip-hop and in rap music you know taking other people's bits and pieces and put your record and put your rapping on it and but uh, the house music was the first one to really make make a make a whole movement of sampling disco music yeah and so the disco music samples are resampled so it's it's a different thing but i think I heard a lot of great recycled '90s tracks that all that were already based on on on, on samples yeah. with, with 2024 or 2023 additives that I really really like that I like better than they did it in the '90s or the 2000s. Sure. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear you. Well, Mr. Fulner. Yes. It's been an absolute pleasure. It was my pleasure. I think. 
you definitely have more to say through your career. Your net career is not anywhere near done yet. I think you got some more time to give us some more hits. Yep. yep. Some more modeling. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 I have to go to the gym. Look at him. Look, oh, look, man. Look at him. He's back. He's coming back strong. He's still on. Look, if you need him to model, send Phil Fulton a he man. <laughs> send a Facebook message say, Phil, we want you back. <laughs> Do what you do. All uh, right. So we wish you all the best of luck and thank you for being part of this show and alumni. And now you're part of it. You're part of the True House Stories family. Hopefully, you and I will someday play together at one of your events. Yeah, yeah. I would love to. I mean, I think we have we have uh, um, we have uh, we have great history, and it's yeah, love to see you. And um, I remember when we were at Musik and Frieden in Berlin. A couple of years ago, yeah. that was really really fun with uh, uh, with uh, Manuel, you know, and Kai Shanghai was was also there from Hotel Shanghai. Kai Shanghai. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I see Manuel often when I when I almost. I know, really he always comes out to see you when he comes into Berlin. When you come into Berlin. Yeah, he's always. He, most of the time, he's with me, and he we we're having like a we have like a traditional when I play at 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 um, Zissifos Winter Garden. We always bring our own bar. Because the people on the bar with the marks are they are so fuzzy, you know, and so we always bring our own stuff, our our drinks, you, you know. Play, do you play those favorite Schlager tunes for Manuel? Because I know he loves Schlager. <laughs> he never told me. <laughs> He'd probably kill me if he heard that. He'd be like, "What?" <laughs> Manuel, stay cool. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, thank you everyone for tuning in around the world, and to our thank friends you from Germany. Phil Fulner, stay in touch with him. Keep, keeps, you know, like keep. Here's the most important, everyone. Keep streaming his records. Get on Spotify, stream his records. He's got a lot of catalog records that are amazing. He does great, solid work. That's why he is a legend in who he is. Thank and you so much. And people give us stamp of approval. Stamp keep approval. On streaming. Keep on streaming, Lenny Fontana records. He's the man with Duane Harden. You know what I mean? You know. I really, I really love that. And I, um, no. and Come here, by the way, I told you last week's song was on. I'll tell you the same. Next year is its 25th anniversary of what you need already. 25 years old. Man, amazing. So, of course, my birthday was September of in the in 21st. I was 29. So, Sam and I were laughing when he signed my record. I was four. So, just do the math. <laughs> Heavenly. Amazing. Good night, everyone around the world. We'll leave you on a good laugh. Stay tuned. Next week, we got Booker T from the London scene wow. coming to tell his story right here on True House Stories. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Fulner. Toodaloo.